Previously in my discussions, I talked about some principles of real life infantry tactics and translated them to squad, focusing on the attack. The goal was to develop good principles for successful gameplay after the infantry combat overhaul. The short and simple is that the update made it harder to move and shoot simultaneously, which makes it a lot harder to attack the enemy. This necessitates more cooperative fire and maneuver tactics as I described in these two videos. If you haven't already, I recommend you watch those because there are some concepts I covered that I won't explain in this video. If you already have, or if you're already knowledgeable about military affairs, then by all means, continue. Knowing how to attack is all well and good, but no team can succeed in squad without the foundation of a strong defense. So that's what we're going to talk about today. In this video, I'm going to draw from my knowledge of real-world infantry tactics to discuss what steps you should take to prepare a defense, the five types of battle positions, and how to utilize protective obstacles like sea wire in your defense plan. If I asked you to go into Jensen's range right now and construct the ultimate impenetrable defense in squad, you'd probably end up with something like this. For some reason, we all have this natural human instinct to construct huge, fat walls when we want to defend something. Even without walls, I've noticed that people have a fixation on linear defense, where troops occupy positions that physically block the enemy's advance. We're going to abandon the stop the enemy by building a wall mentality, whether that's a wall of bricks or a wall of men. Let's begin anew with the question. In modern warfare, what stops the enemy? The answer is the judicious and overwhelming application of firepower. That means that as long as you can shoot somewhere effectively, you can defend that location even if you aren't physically there. Projecting fields of fire is the foundation of the defense that should be enabled by your positioning and should be enhanced by obstacles, not be replaced by them. Specific to our discussion here, it is also important to understand that 99% of the warfare in squad consists of non-contiguous and non-linear operations. That means that the squads in each team aren't typically immediately adjacent to each other in a front, and that those squads are also orienting towards objectives without positioning themselves relative to each other. There is no first squad on our left flank and second platoon on our right. Once you understand this, it makes a lot more sense how you should position yourself and others for maximum effectiveness in squad. The first steps you need to take before preparing a defense, however, require some terrain analysis. You need to determine where the enemy is most likely to attack from, also called their most likely avenue of approach. Let me walk you through an example. All right, it's been a while, but welcome back and welcome to Yeharivka. So let's think for a moment that my job is to defend West Petrivka. How do I go about doing this? Well, the first step is to determine the enemy's most likely avenue of approach. This is where I predict what route the enemy is going to take in their attack. Once I determine this, everything else in my defense plan is built on top of it. First, we consider the direction of the enemy's objective. So if we assume for a moment that our objective is West Petrivka and the enemy holds Upper Petrivka, we can safely assume that most of the enemy's initial attacks will come from the northeast, that is, in this general direction here. Now, if our defense holds and we beat off their initial attacks, then the enemy will try alternative avenues of approach and attack from different angles, trying to probe for weaknesses. This necessitates that we form a 360 degree defense to protect against any and all flanking attacks. And if there are any known enemy spawn locations, Let's say one of our infantry squads scouted out an enemy hab located here on Lima 10. Then we know for certain that there will be an enemy attack coming from that direction. So once I've determined a general direction that a potential attack will come from, I can then look at the terrain to determine the most likely route that the enemy attack will take. So as you can see here on the map, in the direction of this hypothetical enemy hab I've placed on the map, that there is a tree line as well as a defilade that would provide the enemy a covered and concealed approach to use in their attack against Western Petrivka. So I can say with a high degree of confidence that this is the enemy's most likely avenue of approach. Now alternatively, there is also this road. On the map, we can see it leads from the direction of the enemy's spawn down to Western Petrivka. 
which means that any enemy attack that involves vehicles is highly likely to come down this way. So this would be a good position for friendly AT to cover. So now that we've determined two likely enemy avenues of approach, the most likely one being from the hab in the tree line, and the secondary one from this road that enemy vehicles could use, we can now begin constructing our defenses. Once you've conducted this basic terrain analysis, you can begin constructing your defenses. As I covered earlier, the process of constructing your defense focuses on providing your men with good fields of fire. But there are additional elements at play when forming your defensive positions. In this section, I'll be covering the five types of fighting positions, what they are, and what they're for. But first, I need to cover something really important. The first step to any defense is the most basic form of protection that should be practiced even during the offense. Security, security, security. No matter what you are doing, it is vital to have security. This can take the form of a single guy whose job is to watch everyone's backs while they dig fortifications. This ensures that you won't be surprised by the enemy and can quickly react to unexpected attacks. If you want to create more permanent, effective security, you should establish observation posts, also known as OPs. An OP is just one or two guys stationed in front of your main body in the direction the enemy is expected to come from to provide advanced warning of an attack. This not only provides security for your teammates who are in the middle of preparing defenses, but also provides specific information on where the enemy is attacking from. As an alternative to the OP, you can establish patrols that sweep an area back and forth. These are like mobile OPs, useful for when you need to cover a very wide area. It's necessary to have 360 degree security coverage to guard against surprise blinking attacks. Remember that it is not the job of your OPs or patrols to engage the enemy. Once they establish how many enemies are coming from where, their next job is to fall back as quickly and safely as possible to join the main defense. The approaching enemy should only be fired upon once they enter a pre-planned engagement area where the bulk of your firepower can be brought to bear to destroy the attackers. The engagement area should be located between your forward security elements and your main fighting positions. When preparing a defense, most of your squad and teammates should do so by establishing fighting positions, which are the primary locations from which they'll fight. There are five types of fighting positions. Primary, alternate, supplementary, subsequent, and strong points. A primary fighting position is simply the best place from which to accomplish the mission and cover the assigned sector of fire towards the enemy's most likely avenue of approach. An alternative fighting position is a backup fighting position from where you can accomplish the same mission. It is not a fallback position. As the name suggests, it's an alternate location you can shift to while staying on the front line. Alternate fighting positions aren't as important for individuals individuals, but are crucial for heavy weapons like machine guns and anti-tank weapons to give them somewhere else to go and keep fighting after they reveal their positions. A supplementary fighting position is a secondary fighting position that doesn't cover the same angle as the primary fighting position. It exists because the enemy might not come from the expected avenue of approach that the primary fighting position is oriented towards, and covers different routes that the enemy might take. Supplementary fighting positions are especially important in a game like Squad where you will often have small numbers of defenders covering a wide area. A subsequent position is a fighting position that is located further back for a defender to occupy when their current position is untenable. These are fallback positions. A defense doesn't have to be a brick wall that stops the enemy in their tracks. You can use a defense in depth, where a squad intentionally gives ground to the enemy to both preserve itself and to trade space for extra time, which allows friendly squads to reinforce the defense or mount a counterattack towards the enemy spawn. A strong point is a heavily fortified fighting position that's designed to withstand as much as possible that the enemy throws at it with considerable time, effort, and material spent to make it hard to attack. Within a defensive plan, strong points should have a specific purpose, either to redirect the enemy and restrict their movement due to the sheer challenge of attacking the strong point, or to completely stop the enemy in their tracks and tie up their forces. These are the anchor points of a defense. In squad terms, these can be super fobs, but they can also be a smaller cluster of bunkers covering one flank of the objective, making it harder to attack. So given that I think the enemy is most likely to attack from over here, 
through this tree line and might also attack from the north via the road, I can establish my personal fighting positions. In this example, I'm a machine gunner and I think this position inside this house looking out this window is the best position from which I can attack enemies who are moving down that tree line. This is my primary fighting position. So say we have an OP positioned out here on my move mark and they spot the enemy coming in. They'll give me the prior warning I need to be able to easily shoot any enemy that pops up through these trees. So say I begin firing, but the enemy returns fire such that I'm at risk of getting killed, or I'm just too suppressed to be able to effectively fire back. That could mean that enemies are now advancing into the town unhindered. This is when I would move to my alternate battle position. It's important to have a good route planned between your fighting positions. As you can see here, I went from the back of this house behind this fence across this gap to this Hesco block. It may be a good idea to ask my squad leader to put down some sandbags behind this fence line to give me just a little bit of extra protection as I'm moving to my alternate BP. You can see here that I can do a decent job of covering this approach from my alternate fighting position. Actually, it might be a little better and this should be my primary and the other one my alternate. But let's say the enemy does the unexpected and instead of running in a straight line from their hab through this tree line to the objective, they decide to cooperate with an armor squad and conduct a combined arms attack down this road. That's okay. I can run back here to a supplementary battle position. From this position, I'm able to cover that road and be able to engage any enemy infantry that dismounts from a vehicle. Now here I am back in my primary battle position. Let's say that our team is just taking too many casualties. The enemy is pushing up really close. They're about to overrun us and they're throwing frag grenades inside our teammates positions. It's time for me to conduct a retrograde maneuver back to my subsequent battle positions. Here's the first of my subsequent battle positions. Here I can engage enemies that have overrun our first line of defense as they're coming up through these houses. But this position isn't super ideal, it's just for covering our teammates that are falling back and maybe delaying the enemy a little bit. We can keep bounding back to subsequent battle positions to keep delaying the enemy and trading space for time. I can continue this pattern until, say, this strong point here is our final Alamo that we will use as our last line of defense. Now this isn't perfect, it's just an example I threw up real quick to show you guys. But the goal here is to have a very strong defensive position that we use to occupy the enemy for as long as possible while our team is either able to come up and reinforce us or to conduct a counterattack, destroy their spawn point and flank the enemy to destroy the attacking force. Now, a quick note, in squad terms, it's very unlikely that I'll be able to conduct this sort of very clean fallback maneuver to each of my subsequent battle positions during a live match. So in squad terms, these subsequent battle positions that I've set up here can really just be the places that I run to to continue the defense after I die and respawn at the hat. So that's the basics of how fighting positions work. An easy way to enhance the effectiveness of your defense is to construct obstacles and fortifications to augment your fighting positions. You saw how I suggested that some sandbags could be built to cover a route between fighting positions. I could have also built some around each fighting position to give me extra protection. But it's a fine line before I end up giving away my position with excessive and obvious fortifications. Aside from fortifications, I could have also constructed obstacles to enhance the effectiveness of my defense. In particular, sea wire, more commonly known as barbed wire. It's probably the best defensive obstacle you could build, as it's cheap, fast to deploy, and very cost effective. A single layer barbed wire obstacle can be deployed in three shovel hits. You don't need to fully dig it up to make it effective. This simple obstacle by itself vastly complicates the problem facing enemy attackers. It forces them to go around it or expose themselves to try and remove it, making it easier for your defenders to shoot them. Now, if you recall, 
The crux of a defense in modern warfare is the projection of fires to destroy the enemy inside an engagement area. The most straightforward way for you to increase the effectiveness of your defense is by maximizing the enemy's time spent in said engagement area. This is where obstacles like sea wire come in. Properly deployed, wire can stop the enemy, slow them down, or force them to take predictable routes toward pre-positioned heavy weapons. This is called channelizing. And unlike other obstacles like walls or ditches, wire doesn't have the side effect of creating a defilade that provides cover and concealment for the enemy. Sandbag walls or HESCO barriers are useful when you're trying to block or channel enemy vehicles as a sort of improvised anti-armor obstacle since vehicles are not stopped by wire. So the best way to quickly and cheaply enhance the effectiveness of your defense is through strategic placement of wire obstacles. How should you place them? In squad, the ubiquitous type of defense that teams have to conduct is the perimeter defense around an objective, rather than a linear defense. Because remember, squad operations are non-contiguous and non-linear. So the most basic way to use wire is to simply construct a circle around the entire perimeter. This will force the enemy to stop and breach the wire obstacle before being able to contest the capture zone which buys more time for your defenders to engage them. Notice the symbiotic relationship between obstacles and fire in the defense. They complement each other, much like fire and maneuver do in the offense. Always cover your obstacles with fire and always strive to supplement your fires with obstacles. Without defensive fires, obstacles will only present a minor inconvenience for the attacking enemy who can just remove them unopposed. Fires without obstacles give defenders reduced time windows to engage the enemy before there's a risk of being overrun. So when on the defense, use the two together. In reality, we don't have infinite time and resources to prepare a defense, which means that we can't do everything that we would want to do. So in a fast paced game like squad, it's imperative to prioritize your obstacle placement to enhance your most important weapon systems like machine guns and anti-tank weapons. All right, so we're back to our primary fighting position here. Now the best way to enhance the effectiveness of my fires and make it much easier for me to shoot the enemy is by using C wire to constrict where they can go. This is called counter mobility. Now it can be combined with some smart positioning to achieve even greater effectiveness. First, we can position our machine gun on the flank of our defensive position. As you can see, I'm on the flank here now. This also allows for onflating fires across the front of our entire position, like so. In real world terms, this line is called the final protective line. It's a final barrier of firepower that stops the enemy from breaching our position and overrunning the objective. Now in this example, I've placed C wire all along this final protective line so that my machine gun's shooting is that much more effective against enemies that are stopped or slowed by the wire obstacle. Now you can imagine if we had another gun like this on the opposite flank with its own wire, like this, I've created a second machine gun position on the opposite flank here, and I've constructed wire looking down along this line like so. Between the two of us, we create an X across our defense's front that would be very difficult for the enemy to fight through. Now in theory, we could also build additional wires along the engagement area's flanks like so, so that if the enemy tries to move to the flanks outside of this engagement area, they will be boxed in and unable to escape. So that's the theory of how you can construct prepared defenses in squad. In reality, and by that I mean in game, it'll be hard to achieve the ideal, primarily because the terrain will break up your lines of sight and fields of fire, and you'll be fighting against an uncooperative enemy that's not going to just waltz into your engagement areas. And that's okay. Just do your best with what you have, and your defense will be stronger with these preparations than without. Terrain analysis is the key to all of this, so learning to see the world with a soldier's eye is very important. One final tip I have for you is that there will be spots in your engagement areas where you can't engage with direct fire weapons because it's dead ground in a deflade. These are the areas you should sight in for your mortars and grenade launchers to hit. 
your direct and indirect fire weapons should have fire plans that complement each other. This is combined arms warfare, even at the small unit infantry level. A prepared defense is intricate and interconnected, with all of its components working together as a singular whole. So that was a really quick and dirty overview of some principles you can use in the defense and squad. And I know that there was a lot of information. So here's a recap. First, any defensive plan must determine where the enemy is most likely to attack from. But at the same time, every defense needs to have a 360 degree perimeter because operations in squad are non-contiguous, non-linear, and fast-paced. Second, no defense should go without security, which can consist of simple OPs to provide advance warning of an enemy attack. Third, every individual should locate and plan several different types of fighting positions. We covered the five types in this video. These don't have to be super sophisticated and built up. They can be just a spot you mentally bookmark for later use. Just the process of thinking these through will provide an advantage against an enemy that is more than likely attacking the unknown. Alternate fighting positions in particular are very important for key weapons like machine guns and anti-tank weapons for when their positions are revealed. This allows them to stay alive and keep fighting through the whole battle. I talked a lot about specifics in this video, but don't take this to mean that this is how you need to do things. Rather than mindlessly imitating what I did here, I encourage you to focus on the principles behind why certain things were done. For example, the symbiotic relationship between obstacles and fire, or the value of being mentally prepared through planning and not just physically prepared through the construction of millions of fortifications. If you have any knowledge of your own to impart to the community, please comment down below, as a goal of mine is for these videos to be conversation starters more than one-way lectures. That said, the comment section has historically proven to be a battlefield of its own, so venture down there at your own risk. Otherwise, consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed this video. It's much appreciated. I hope you enjoyed.